Hello, everyone. We are here with Director of Photography, uh, Stefan Chupek, and he has a new project out coming out tomorrow called Rumors. It's a pretty amazing movie. Uh, Stefan, how are you? Very good. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Oh, I'm so excited to talk about the the visual language in this movie. Um, mm -hmm. It's just, it's super rich. But uh, to give our viewers a, a, an idea, uh, what is the film about? Can you describe the plot briefly? Well, that's maybe the hardest question to ask <laughs> because you've seen the film, you know, it's kind of, it's it's very difficult to put it into five or seven words. It's, but basically I tried, it's a political satire set around the G7. And so we have those G7 leaders uh, from the world at the annual G7 meeting and they're sitting together to provide a statement on the global crisis of the world, put that uh, statement together, and then things go very, very different and uh, unexpected. And we get to know uh, each of the G7 uh, prime ministers and presidents in a different way. And I think it's a, it's a very, uh, very nice, um, like if we look at the world today and uh, see uh, what, what the prime minister, what the presidents of the G7 in those meetings have achieved, it feels a little bit uh, like a comedy on its own. We've been watching as preparation quite a few uh, of those G7 documentaries, how they kind of meet up and uh, their body language, and we just watch them without sound. And you kind of see this is comedy on its own in a way. You kind of see that on one hand, the, the world. Um, uh, has its global crisis going on and how the leaders of the world are dealing with this crisis and how each year uh, the statements are kind of trying to address it but not really addressing it. So it's a very, very satirical um, and surreal take on today's politics. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. I have to say that I, I found it just absolutely hilarious. Um, and you know, because of the pretense of how important they believe their work to be, mm -hmm. they really, they, they couldn't handle their own lives. <laughs> so <laughs> both, both, you know, in, in immediate, uh, in, in the immediate and, and just overall, it was, it was hilarious. Mm -hmm. Um, but, and the more we research, the more, the more we research about it, I mean, just the films releasing now and just the, a week ago, I saw that the French uh, prime minister is calling the Italian prime minister because they've taken Emily in Paris away from France and how he's going to fight to get Emily in Paris back to France. You know, you just see something like this is just so much onto our topic. You just feel like um, exactly you, some, at some point politicians don't really address the real problems of the world. Yeah, exactly. It's all it's it's a tempest in a teapot when there's so much yeah. going on. Um, <laughs> And um, the visual language of the film was was very interesting. I'd like to talk to you about that and and how you landed on that. Um, mm -hmm. can, can you just first of all, can you describe uh, the visual language of the film for me? Well, um, the thing is, maybe if I start, well, it's it's not one visual language. Basically, the film has a lot of different genres inside. And that's if you look at the directors I work with, Guy Madden, Evan and Galen Johnson <clears throat> and their work, they've been like very, like very artistic directors and also very kind of extreme their visual expression. So, and they've been very encouraging to make this world um, surreal in a way. So even the starting point, which is a kind of, let's say most naturalistic when the G7 leaders meet at bright daylight and they stand right. there. So uh, it should have, you know, yes. You know. So there it should have this, uh, a little bit of a, like we, we watched of quite a few of the G7 meetings and there was, was one or two videos, which we uh, liked a lot. And we kind of tried to restage that a little bit. So we try to stay, but, but not quite news real like, but the cinematic version of that, you know, kind of with a very straight, composition with them all lined up on the stage, the red quite intensely framed up there and, and the castle behind them. We've been looking for uh, quite a few places to find this postcard, picture postcard shot. And if you look at the original digital media, it's sometimes hard to replicate that because they are just such, you know, you just feel like 
there is the staging of the original G7 meetings is just sometimes so weird in, in reality. So it's hard to top that in the cinematic language in a way. Yeah, it felt, um, that shot felt very Kubrick. It felt very, you know, just mm. head on maximalist. Yeah. You know, but also, like you said, it had to be mm. accurate, but cinematic. So, yeah. And I like that the film starts straight into it. They are assembling. We've seen this, this image that we've seen a hundred times. G7 leaders kind of assembling for a meeting. <clears throat> and that's why we start straight in. And then they head for the gazebo. And then they, you know, you would expect them to have a bit more political conversation. But actually, uh, yeah. it's already going straight into the personal drama of uh, the Canadian Prime Minister <laughs> in a different <laughs> personal life. <laughs> and so once they get to the gazebo, well, I mean, there's the discovery. And then mm -hmm. once they get to the gazebo, things start to change, don't they? Yeah. Visually speaking. Visually speaking, yeah. Not immediately, but but yeah, I mean, the beginning of uh, it's still kind of quite formal as they sit around the table. It's uh, carefully framed close-ups, each of them having their conversations, a lot of private set and sideline conversations before they kind of draw back into actually getting in, into their, their, their subject matter while they're meeting together. <clears throat> yes, and then um, um, I think we, we dive into this Guy Medinesk and Evan Gellin Johnson's world of, you know, when when all of a sudden uh, all the aids in the world outside seems to disappear and they land in their own crisis all of a sudden, then the whole genre of the film kind of changes and we're shifting into something um, entirely different. Yeah, and darkness falls. And um, there my thought was, basically we've been, we spent so much time, so we shot this film, by the way, in Hungary in, 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 uh, in Budapest and the forests all around Budapest and spent a lot of time scouting those forests and obviously, um, um, to get this atmosphere, we were late on fog. That was the first thing that we wanted to have thick layers of fog, which I can backlight light and make this whole forest look very mystical, surreal, actually, and color infused. Yeah, I was going to ask about that. I mean, was that actual hey? Was that actual fog, or was that haze that you had to create? Well, no, that was all like we created. That was like we had to, it's all created for the shot. So wow. each setup, we had a stage, a massive area in the forest, and we had to lay like 800 meters of, of pipes uh, around uh, to kind of, you know, uh, to, to get the fog uh, in the area we wanted. And you have to adjust it to the direction of wind and stuff. So it's a very, <clears throat> very complicated thing, but uh, we made it work, yeah. Wow. <clears throat> and and all of this is in service of of just the mood and mood that you're trying to convey in the film. Yes, that's correct. That's and correct. it's so I don't know. Uh it's it's so fascinating to me that if it's you know mm -hmm. that that it, people it it they notice it, but they don't notice it. Yeah. And, and there's so much craft behind. Yeah. Creating thank it. you. Yeah, thank you. Oh. We spent a lot of time to figure out because the directors is a little, another little side story. They've actually never made a film outside on relocation. So mm -hmm. the films they've made were smaller and more kind of studio, small studio interior based. So it was very a big curiosity for them to go into a forest and shoot scenes at night. And if you scout those locations at daytime in a forest, obviously daytime forest normally looks very different to nighttime. Right. So I decided that we needed to see that and and discuss it on on the go. So we we for a test shoot we had an entire setup including fog and lighting and everything, and we had a few extras there. And we just for one night spent in the forest and I showed them all the different colors we can achieve and all the different looks with fog. And we stood there with the entire production crew out on set and wow. making a test um, for real, just to be able to you know to to kind of nail it and to kind of also for them also to see how does it look and how does it feel so an entire big production test um, prior to, to the shoot and yeah and then they, I kind of uh, showed them all kinds of color variations um, I always have a color contrast between the background so the backlight and the foreground actors so ma ma mainly yes. it's warmer light on the actors and very kind of cold cyan greenish uh, right. light I, I on the background of the forest yeah, I saw so, that. Um, 
And we, whenever this this con color contrast worked the best for a lot of things. But whenever there's fire at play, I went really, really red and intense. I went hyper natural in a way, like I I kind of pushed the color to to beyond what it was actually to get right. the surrealist feeling of the film. Yeah, it seemed, and uh, it correct me if I'm wrong, but it seemed as if. Uh, the more fantastic and 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 surreal the film got, yeah. the more saturated the colors were. Yes, yes. I mean, in a way, I I basically I um the saturation level goes really really high to to begin with when we enter into the night and the first time when when uh, Kate is meeting Roy, so the German with the with the, with the Canadian prime minister, and they have a little love moment. Uh, so this is probably one of the most intense moments color-wise in the film for a little peak to begin with. And then towards the, the journey towards the end, obviously, when they are sitting at this, um, um, in the castle in the original meeting place and 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 uh, the the most, uh, the Ten Commandments sky, the sky from, literally we have, we watched a few like night, the original Ten Commandments where we have this paper cut out kind of, you know, the hyper real back painted sky and it, those intense color from colors from Technicolor, we try to recreate that feel where basically the, the last dawn is coming um, and we, you know, we lit the whole scene of them sitting inside this castle room uh, in this red, hyper, hyper intense, uh, warm uh, light. Yeah. Bathe them, in the, bathe them in the, in the, in the color of the end of the world, kind of. Um, <clears throat> Just so funny. Yeah. But um, reading the script there, I felt, I felt that um, I couldn't, I couldn't overdo it also with those directors. We, they, they were just always very, when I showed them something very extreme, they would go, yeah, can you do that even more extreme? So they were very inviting, but obviously if you have a script, where, a giant, where there is a giant brain the size of a hatchback as part of the scenes in the film. Like if you have elements like these, you obviously, you can't do enough on the camera side to support that sure. absurdity. The, how, how, how much uh, creative input did the three directors, Evan Johnson, Galen Johnson, Guy Madden, how, how, how much creative input did they have in how you shot? And and you know what you shot and the way you shot it and the framing of the shots. Well, um, we had a lot of input to begin with in the prep time because we watched a lot of films that were sometimes not really related. But you know, let's we had a situation like what? Let's watch a Seven Samurai because it's seven leaders, seven heroes, kind of walking through the the Kurosawa one. So that for blocking how to deal with seven people. Um, yeah, then Buñuel's uh, Exterminating Angel film, we watched that as well. Like a lot of very different, sometimes just uh, vaguely related films. There were some images from Green Fork, which we kind of liked the night things at. And I worked on a film called Antichrist, like from 10, 12, 10 years ago. You there was worked a lot on of, Antichrist? Yeah, I was the second cinematographer there and I shot a lot of the forest sequences. So that was also <laughs> something we spoke about. So <laughs> yes. Give me a minute. Um, <laughs> <laughs> yes antichrist easily mm -hmm. one of the most disturbing films i've seen and the, i mean but the shots of the forest those are yours no some of them i was a <clears throat> cinematographer so yeah uh, i worked on quite a few of those shots i did the whole color design i was a colorist on the film so i did the color design together with the main dop and so um yeah um that was kind of so i learned a lot about forests and smoke and fog and darkness but obviously this is a different subject matter obviously, rumors obviously. so it had to be lighter and i just you know i just loved the idea to be dark but the darker we went the more color had to get into the image feeling sure. that you want to counteract the the seriousness otherwise of it in a way that's was one of the approaches um yeah and i think that was that i think that's key to making the audience believe the the comedy or fall into the satire of it is that the 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 action is played very straight mm -hmm. very straight um yeah. and i assume that you when this for the for the scene with the brain i'm assuming you watched a lot of uh 50s horror films um, yes 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 <laughs> <laughs> quite a few quite a few and um but but if you watch if you watch uh, like guy mentioned the director's work um you know, if you if you watch uh, the Green Fork, which is obviously found footage film, or um, um, 
sorry, I just lost the Italian. But if you, if you watch their work, there's basically so much inspiration from these periods of time. Uh, we prepared another film to, before, which we didn't get to shoot, but there we watched, I looked at a lot of Technicolor, 1940s, 50s cinematography and two color, like basically the beginning of um, color, color cinema in a way. And you, the thing is, we never really wanted to copy any style because quite some films just say, okay, we take this as a reference. We kind of, I felt that more being inspired by these films and then creating my own thing because back in the past also was great cinematographers. They, they didn't just, you know, take a look and they, they just felt, I'm, I'm a strong believer in at some point giving up your references and creating your own thing and trusting well, yeah, your that's, own thing. Yeah, that's exactly what you should do. Um, you mm -hmm. can pay homage, but you know, make it your yeah. own as well. Yeah, um, but this was the most inviting, bravely by the directors. We, and the way I set it up was that I, at all times, had always full color control for each scene. So I lit a scene like a stage, like I gave, I gave the actors a lot of space to breathe. That was important because I thought, okay, there's always, the challenging thing here was that there's always seven actors in the, in the scenes most of the time. And if you do blocking of a scene, you have to always think of the close-ups as well, right? So when an actor moves around and the eye line changes, it can become very complicated. So I had to be very flexible and open. So I lit a stage the size of a, like a soccer field in the forest, sometimes bigger. And then we gave the actors some freedom to find their blocking, also to be, uh, you know, a bit more spontaneous. And once we kind of found the blocking of a scene, I then had to go in quickly and do all the close-ups. So... Um, that kind of uh, uh, dictated a certain lighting style because, you know, of time, uh, time constraints. So, so yeah. even the actors had a, uh, some sort of a say in... Well, you always, you always do that, basically. The actors always um, get... Um, basically, you have an idea for a scene, and with seven people, it's nearly impossible because each actor wants to have a certain dynamic. It's easy to have a, an idea about, about a scene of two actors. You go there, you stand here, that's it. But each actor wants to bring in an input. And if Kate Blanchett has an idea about her you know, performance, it's not sitting, it's standing, it's moving across. So basically you start always an idea and develop it together, the actors, to something that works for the scene, that takes time. And then obviously you have to find a, a way to, 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 to shoot that. And seven actors makes everything seven times more complicated, but also uh, exciting in a way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it definitely <laughs> felt organic. But, um, you know, and I, I'm just so curious, how was Kate Blanchett to work with? Oh, so amazing. It's, um, you know, it's I, I was obviously a bit, quite a bit nervous before the first day working with uh, photographing her um uh, but um she's she's so amazing first of all like through her persona how she takes out that that on the, on your first meeting this level of nervousness that everybody around her has you know by being like very approachable and seeking a conversation and stuff and and um <clears throat> the, the the amazing thing about that about her is she knows her frame and she kind of in, a, in an interesting way, it also dictates the frame in a way. It's a, it's a give and a take. So she takes, she looks when you do a rehearsal and you shoot a scene, she looks at the rehearsal after at the playback. Very few actors do that and very few actors would normally ask for that. She sees it because she sees the frame like a stage, like a theater stage. She needs to see what's happening. Like in a the person. Frame, especially in the shot. And then once she knows that, it's like a dance with a camera. She really, she's so camera aware and so light aware she cat she catches if you're in a the forest there's a lot of shaded bits and the light can only go for a bit she catches the exact moment where the light is hitting her it's amazing to see her besides her performing the part being so camera aware i've never experienced somebody like that it's literally like it's like sometimes filming an actor can be I do one thing on the camera and the actor does and you try to find a synchro synch synchronizing moment with Kate Blanchett it's like a dance it's literally like the camera is dancing and it's it's a together thing oh is, I love uh, that the most unusual I've ever experienced Beautiful. that's that's so good to hear I'm so glad um yeah so uh is were there any particular shots in the film that you're very proud of that we should look out for Without um, let me think. <clears throat> well, I think it's more. No, I think I think it's a whole world that I was 
able and allowed to build in a way. It's kind of, it's not a single shot. Obviously the sequence, I love the way the, the brain looks, the brain yeah. that we back hit in green light. And as Roy, the, 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 the Canadian Prime Minister approaches us, that there's a certain mood there. It's also because I never had to frame a giant brain in my life. I was like, okay, how does it work? I didn't know which lens to use to get it all working. <laughs> so, um, no, that, that was quite amazing. And there's quite a few very challenging long sequences where they are walking, right? And and I'm leading them the steady cam, and we're talking about a 600 meter shot, like 600 meter tracking, which is a very long distance, which is for me difficult because I have to light all that path in a way. So there are quite a few challenges. But you know, I think for me it's like I get excited when when the camera is capturing the performance in the best way, and when I give them the space. I don't. This is a kind of film where I don't think about my camera. I just feel like okay, I capture it their performance, their, their, that, that's this kind of interaction in a way. It's a very that's... generous thing for a, a DP to do. So I, I like that you're very cognizant of capturing that. That's amazing. Thank so, um, so yeah, so, I mean, honestly, I loved the movie. I thought it was strange. It was surreal. It was mm -hmm. very fun. And I really loved the visual, uh, the visual language of the film um and i'm glad i i caught i was like i think this is what he's doing but yes i'm, I'm glad i was right um <laughs> with the escalating chaos and the fantastic nature of the movie but um anyway yeah. so uh stefan thank you so much for taking thank the time you. um you guys everybody catch rumors um mm -hmm. it comes out tomorrow that would be yeah. the date that would be october 18th um yeah. Stefan, uh great work and I hope I hope to talk to you again on your next project. Thank you ever so much. I'm All so right. glad having been with you in this uh conversation. Thank you. It was awesome. Thank you. Bye. Mm -hmm.